120 odd pages, about 70 waters. Um, that's, uh, you know, what the, what the sort of content's like inside. Um, catchment by catchment, water by water. I cover my definition of a water that's worth including. I'll read it to you is, so I don't misquote myself. Um, I say, um, if you want an exhaustive reference to every water west of the Hume Highway that may at times contain trout, this isn't it. Rather, it's a guide to those lakes and a few streams which more often than not are worthy of serious consideration. For example, some readers may, may disagree with my failures to include detailed reference to lakes like Burrumbeet and Learmont. Um, but I would argue that while these waters can be good, even great during the brief boom periods and are certainly worth stocking at those times, they spend too long in bust mode to be included here. So it's long term. So it's looking at it since 1970 um, and making that sort of assessment. So basically it has to have a reliability rating of fair, which is probably, if you want to simplify that, it's probably average in one year in two it's worth fishing um and it's basically somewhere that one year in two i would find a time during the year when i would send a, um, a visitor to one of those waters so that's the sort of standard i've set um there's no point in me giving you know a 500 page book of every little creek that may occasionally or every little lake that may occasionally have trout i've tried to be broader than that um, so reliability, best months to fish, catchment by catchment. And at the beginning, I um, try to give a bit of an overview as to my approach to fishing Western Victoria, which is quite different in many respects to how I would fish Eastern Victoria, which my first guidebook was about, Northeast Victoria. So I'll get on to the... Um, I'll get on to the presentation if you like, Is that, if that suits Ben, because I've got a PowerPoint here and like we'll keep, we'll link back to the book for that. So hopefully the two will interconnect. Um, so let's see how we go. Oh, hang on. First of all, I should try sharing a screen, shouldn't I? Then I should click on that. And please tell me you can see that. All good. Let me yeah, just perfect. go from the beginning. Let's see if my computer is going to be nice. And can you still see it? Yep. Yep. You've got enough. a picture of a guy standing under the tree at Tullarook in the rain. Yes. Fantastic. Okay. We'll make a start on the actual uh, talk itself. And I said to uh, Chris, I'm really, really keen to answer questions. So um, I'm going to spend, I don't know, 20 minutes on this. Um, but I'm sure there's lots of people out there who've got their own questions and uh, if they don't have them, they may well by the end of this little presentation. So I'm really, really happy to help, really happy to do what I can to answer. So um, I don't know about this particular group. Um, I guess there's some dedicated lake fishers. In fact, I know there's some dedicated lake fishers in the mix. But as I said to Chris when we were discussing what I was going to chat about tonight, um, whether it's the sheer size of lakes, um, the lack of obvious lies compared to a stream, um, often there's few clear signs of life, and that sinking feeling, I've got the wrong fly on. Um, I think a lot of fly fishers drop out of Western lakes, uh, Western Victorian lake fishing before they've caught a single fish. Um, and I think that's a pity because Western Victorian lakes are a fairly big chunk of the resource that we have available to ourselves in Victoria. Um, and contrary to what that uh, picture looks like, it's not all standing glumly in the rain, wondering what the heck to do next. Let me show you what it can be all about. Hepburn Lagoon a week ago. Sight fishing with a stick caddis. 
and a very big fish grabs it. So, and yes, it did end happily. Um, so, you know, that's uh, world class, I reckon, hooking a sort of five, six pound brown trout that you've spotted. Um, and that's not been unusual in the last uh, several months on these lakes. But as you'll discover, I didn't just waltz up to that spot, throw my fly out, and there was immediately a big fish there. There was a lot more to it. So how do you get from where at least some of you are now to, let's just watch that again, shall we? I really like it. There's me kneeling down. To getting onto a mini marlin in a western lake. How do we get from get to get from one to the other? Let's see. Um, so I've already mentioned the book, but at the risk of uh, terrible self promotion, um, I do. It's my best effort to try and you know coach people through Western Victorian fishing, both in terms of techniques and tactics, and of course, the idiosyncrasies of the waters themselves. So that's step one. I, my son very dutifully bottling the book. That's uh, him on the inside front cover, if anybody's got that, got the book. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty good uh, part. It's, it's um, uh, whilst, dare I say it, while you haven't got a lot more to do, fishing wise would probably be a good opportunity to read right through it rather than waiting until you can go fishing and then picking out the water or um, area that you want to visit because reading it right through now will give you context and then you can go back to it and treat it like a sort of mini Melways as to where you might like to go. Um, the, 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 next, the next step in the planning process is where I reckon we've, we've all got a bit lazy and I'm guilty of it myself sometimes. Um, we've never had it so good for online information, have we? Doesn't matter what you're talking about. Well, at least superficially, we've never had it so good. Um, the problem is that much of the information that we have um, access to is a tidal wave of information and a lot of it is unmoderated. When I started writing uh, 30 odd years ago, um, the only way you could really speak to the world was if you could demonstrate that there was a significant audience. So editors and publishers, radio program um, hosts, media moguls, etc., would only let you talk to everybody if they thought you were going to be compelled to a big audience. Now, that doesn't mean to say that everything you had to say was true and virtuous, but it did, did mean that there was some sort of a filter. Well, now, as we know, anybody can say anything and talk to the world. So you've got to keep that in mind when you're looking at fishing reports. Um, I said in a recent article um, that while a few mod well-moderated and fact-checked sites, forums and pages provide solid information, for many, it seems that successful anglers don't want to share unsuccessful anglers want to complain and the weird ones just want to make stuff up right um, and it can be very difficult to distinguish between the good information and the bad information so i think we have to make an effort ourselves to get what i call the fundamentals and i've been giving talks somewhat like this for many many years whether it be about the snow mountains or Tasmania or stream fishing or whatever, brim fishing, cod fishing. Um, you know, one thing you can get accurate information about is the fundamentals. So the first thing, if you're going to go and fish Newland Reservoir, let's give that example because we come back to it later, but it's one of dozens, as you know. Um, most of these lakes rely upon stocking. So one thing you can check is recent stocking history. Now that's just a screen grab of, a, of uh, this year for Newland. Pretty good. Um, if you go back to, if you go back two years or three years, you'll get a pretty good sense of what's gone in. It's almost like looking successful recruitment on a natural water, um, only this time it's artificial. It's, uh, it's, it's fish that have been put in 
from, uh, from Snobs Creek Hatchery basically, and sometimes a few private hatcheries as well. So that's really useful information. So, okay, good numbers of fish have gone in. That by itself is a useful piece of information, but not of course a useful piece of information on its own because the second part of the equation, as we all know with trout or any other worthwhile fish is habitat. So they've gone in, but then what's happened to them? Well, probably the single biggest predictor of what's happened to them since they've gone in is the recent water history of these lakes. So um, a classic case that a lot of you would be familiar with would be Lake Tolondo. Now, Lake Tolondo, basically for the last decade has hovered between fabulous um, to just about not worth fishing. And pretty much the only variable in that uh, picture has been water quality. It's a long way north, it's low elevation. If it gets down to say five, six, seven thousand, eight thousand megalitres, which I think it is now, it's probably only about two metres deep at the most. Have a look at the temperatures in, at Horsham, the nearest town over summer. 40 degrees, 45 degrees is nothing unusual. Much hotter certainly than what I get up in the Central Highlands here and even what a lot of you would get in Melbourne and uh, Gisborne and Woodend and so forth. So if Lake Tolondo is insufficiently full, I would say a lot of the fish don't make it through summer. So regardless of how many have gone in, um, if they don't make it through summer, and summer's the critical point, then the chances of you having good fishing there aren't so good. So just with those two pieces of information, stocking history and recent water history, and you can check these on numerous sites, I go into some of them in the book, um, you, you, can, you can form a good picture without even talking to anybody you can have a fairly good idea, not a perfect idea, but a fairly good idea about what the fundamentals are for the water in question. This is Lake Tulia Rook, a classic Western District Lake, shallow, very productive, but again, not quite to the same extent as Tolondo. It, is, it lives and dies on um, how much water it retains over the preceding summer ideally the preceding two summers. Fish go fast in these lakes, so sometimes one summer of good water levels is okay. And as you can see in that picture, the water's right down. It's beyond the, um, the fishing pontoons and it's beyond the boat ramp. So if that's, that was taken in autumn, and that was about three years ago, that picture, I think. Um, so you've just got to, whoops, I'll just turn my sun down. Um, the, water that's in that lake over summer is going to be marginal for the fish to have survived or survived in good numbers and thrived in good numbers. So that's part two. And then part three is the here and now. So you're going to go and fish, say, Newland Reservoir, um, and you haven't been there for a year, and you haven't spoken to anybody who has. So what do you want to know? Well, you want to know what the current level is, and what level's been over the last few weeks? So has it come up? Has it gone down? If it's come up, has it gone up very fast? Very fast rises in lake level are often an indication of flood inflows. And flood inflows for most of the lakes in the book, not all, but most mean dirty water, really dirty water sometimes in the case of a lake like Tullarook. Um, you can look at, then, then you can look at the weather. Um, what's the weather likely to be on the day that you want to visit? And for a shallow clear lake, you might think want some overcast weather, maybe a bit of rough on the surface. For a deeper lake, um, not so crucial, not so important to have overcast. Fish may well still feed very well in bright conditions. You might even be able to enjoy some polaroiding and so on and so forth. And thinking about the wind direction. So just to give the Tully Rook example, the only good access to Tulia Rook is the eastern shore. Without a boat, it's a walk of many kilometres to get round to the western shore. Today, um, the, and for the last few days, the shore that you can drive to would have been surf. Now, it's all very well to say, yeah, you should be able to fish into the wind, but certainly if you're new to this, and even if you're not, 
you know, for my approach to lake fishing, I would rather fish where I can, where I've got a good chance of seeing a fish. And I'm going to struggle to see fish in two foot waves. So I usually try to put the wind at my back or at least parallel to the bank. So that's a consideration that I'm making when I make a decision about where to go. Um, gear. I'm really fanatical about gear for lake fishing and the reason I'm so fanatical above all else is because of the size of the fish that you're likely to encounter. So the, 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 the fish that uh, you saw me hook up to at Hepburn last week on that video um, at the earlier on in the presentation, I mean, that is not something you can manage with your typical Stevenson River, Rubicon River, King Parrot Creek setup. You're just going to get busted clean off. Um, I don't care how good you are, you're going to get busted clean off. They're fast, strong, powerful, and you've gone to a lot more trouble to hook each one than you will have done on the Stevenson or the Rubicon or the Delatide or the Hauker or the Ovens, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So having gone to that trouble, personally, I'm really upset if I lose them through something that I could have avoided. Now, sometimes you just lose fish fair and square. It's a bugger, but what can you do? Hook falls out. Um, they wrap you around an un unseen log. What can you do, right? But if it's something you could have avoided, I really, you know, I sort of, the, those, those moments haunt me to this day. So call me shallow, but I like to lamb a big fish. So on that basis, yes, you do need a decent reel, something with a decent drag. You do need backing. People who say you don't need a good drag for trout fishing, you don't need backing for trout fishing. You know what? They haven't hooked a big enough trout. That's what it boils down to. And in Western Victoria, you will definitely be in the running to hook a really big trout. That's part of the trade-off for all the other work you have to do. And knots, the rule with knots is simple. I don't really care what you use. There are arguments to make for all sorts of knots. But what I do want you to do is test every knot after you tie it. Because you want it to break now and not when there's an eight pounder on the end. So now's the time for the knot to break. Breaks now, you've lost three minutes while you retie the knot. Breaks on the trout of the year and it's a tragedy. So test your knot, test your tippet knots, your backing knot when you tie it on. Backing knot should be fail safe, but hey, let's, let's test them. I had a client tell me the other day about a fail backing knot. Um, so it does happen and test your hook to fly knot. So we, can, we could talk all night about knots, we're not going to, but we are gonna make the point, please test your knots. And if you've heard me talk before, you would have heard me talk about big nets. Please don't go anywhere near these lakes with those little ornamental tea strainers that you see people, you know, putting on their den wall and carrying up these little creeks. I don't know why you're carrying it up those little creeks, but there you go, people do it. Um, you need a net that's going to accommodate the largest trout you're ever likely to hook. Uh, comfortably accommodated, not something you have to thread through, like trying to sort of put a cork in a bottle. You need to be able to comfortably accommodate the biggest trout you're ever going to catch. So that's a pretty big trout that Max has got at Lake Fyans <coughs> this time last year. Um, but uh, there's still plenty more room if it had been twice as big. So Chris, you know that fish you caught on the Goulburn? That's your standard. Your net needs to be able to accommodate a fish that big, which I gather it did, or at least someone's net did, right? So lash out, go to the shop and buy yourself a net that's big enough to accommodate the biggest trout you're ever gonna catch in your life. Of course, let me tell you, when that happens, you'll be so grateful you listen to what I said. Only has to happen once. Probably happened a lot more than that, but one be enough. Um, and it needs to be easily deployed. You know, talk to Andrew Fuller or Dobbo about systems for, you know, getting nets off your back quickly. You don't want to be putting a net together like a piece of Meccano when you've got a 10 pound trout on the end, do you? So fold up nets, you want to be damn sure they're going to fold out really quickly and they're not going to collapse when they've got a bit of weight in them. So they're not my idea of a good idea, but you know, like I say, it's their own, but you need, you need your net to be, your net, your net is a crucial piece
piece of equipment. And I've heard a story just in the last week of people beaching their big trout and it not going very well. There are a hundred reasons why beaching won't work. Um, and you don't want to work your way through them. Just get yourself a decent net. Do I sound like a person who's seen a few net tragedies or lack of net tragedies? All right. I guess we've got to get the fish on the end in the first place before we can use a net. So um, this is a, uh, flies are a fraught topic, not because they're not incredibly important, but uh, it's quite remarkable how many flies can and do succeed. It's quite remarkable if you talk to several uh, trout experts what their favourite lake flies are and how they differ from one another. Um, and I guess the bottom line is that flies are important, but they're only as good as how they're fished. But, you know, people want to know what I use. So here's some straight out of the box. Um, it's not an exhaustive list by any means, but at the top there, you'll see I've got some woolly buggers. And I suppose those flies at the top are giving you some sort of sense as to, you know, what, what I like in a woolly bugger. So here's one with a little bit of flash, not much hackle, slightly mangled looking tail because it's caught so many trout. Emu woolly bugger from the late Muzz Wilson, beautifully wiggly fly. It's one of the few bulky woolly buggers that I use that I can use that won't twist the line because the emu is so soft. And there's a little classic sort of, I suppose, Mark II variant, and it's small. That's probably the standout thing about that one. Woolly buggers don't have to be big. Um, and there probably flies all three of those that I'm going to use when it's a bit overcast early and late in the day, a bit rough. I'm not going to use these flies when it's bright and flat all that often unless I get them deep. Then I might. You know, if I can get them down, I might use them. Um, I was a bit lazy here because there's a few flies like the wet zonka which fulfill the same role. Tom Jones is a classic. Um, BMS is another classic. Um, what those flies have got in common is that they're, 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 they're sparse-ish flies and they're minnow, minnow patterns. And minnows, whether that be Galaxias, uh, Redfin Fry or Australian Smelt, are a really important part of the diet on most of the uh, lakes that are in my book. You know, if you've read anything I've written, you'll know that I really like stick caddis and I really like the scintilla stick caddis above all. So easy to tie that even, that even I can tie a decent one. Um, the only thing I'd say about stick caddis is have a few sizes and have a few colours. We're beginning to realise that there are in fact occasions where the colour varies from that quite dark to that quite greeny, lighty colour. Um, and that's because in most but not all cases, uh, stick caddis larva, uh, pupa, larva rather, build their case out of the available material. And of course that changes as the year, ch as the year changes. So in autumn, the cases are often quite dark. Uh, well into spring, there's a lot of green material to build with, so they become green. Then, oh, whoops, sorry about that. Then we've got the, um, the good old midge. Midge are a real psychological barrier. Stick caddis are a psychological barrier. Talk about the squirmy worm. I mean, the stick caddis, one of the reasons it ended up impressing me was because I thought it was useless. And usually for a fly to uh, succeed, you have to believe it's going to work. Well, I thought there's no way in the world to try to be stupid enough to eat one of them. But they did, and so I was converted. And midge aren't, midge aren't too dissimilar. But like stick caddis, they're one of the best imitations in the box. There's a little red super glue buzzer. There's my Millie Midge. They're small, boring. Um, I was guiding at Millbrook uh, on Monday, and I watched a 12 pound trout, which is the biggest trout I've had the pleasure of putting in the net for a few years at Millbrook, swim over and eat a size. 14 red super glue buzzer. So, you know, it's, uh, they might look like crap to us, but hey, three times the protein of steak, and the trout must know that, um, because they really, really love them, and they're abundant, and they're 
uh, that, you know, they'll survive in all sorts of habitats, unlike some of our more glamorous insects like mayfly, which, you know, need quite specific conditions in which to thrive. Midge are uh, the masters of virtually anything and a very, very, very short life cycle. So the numbers can multiply exponentially very, very quickly. So don't forget midge, even if you can't get your head around the fact that a fish would eat them. Um, I haven't got pictures of everything. Damselfly nymphs, skinny's the go. Skinny, long and skinny. That's what you want with your damselfly nymph. Fulling mill living damsel is a great example, but there are many, many others. And speaking of mayfly, yeah, um, you want to have some in your box in case you're at a lake like Hepburn or Newland or Wenderee when they pop. Um, because when trout are on mayfly, it's wonderful. We all know that. Um, so you want to have some on standby just in case. Shaving brushes, possum emerges. Um, and, and for when they're not actually taking off the top, flies like, um, well, pretty skinny, dark coloured nymphs, even claret coloured. And beetle patterns are good because beetles do get out of the trees and early in the season on about half of the lakes in my book, cockchafer beetles are a chance on evening and that's pretty fantastic when it happens. Fingernail sized uh, black blobs of black and brown blobs of uh, foam. It's pretty good fun fishing a great big fat dry fly in the end of August. So beetles are worth having in the box, plus some smaller ones too, because beetles are pretty ubiquitous and will get out. I mean, we could go on and on about ants and termites and so forth that turn up occasionally, but got to draw a line somewhere. So that'll do for flies, except to say what I said earlier, which is that, you know, you've got, it's how you fish the fly as much as anything that makes a difference. And I'll give you some examples a bit later on in the talk, but um, it's crucially important. I mean, that, uh, that hookup, to that great big brown at uh, Hepburn last week. That took a stick caddis, deliberately fished inert under an indicator. In those bright conditions, I would have been reluctant to move a fly very much. So it was great that I could actually see that fish and put an inert fly a couple of metres ahead of it. And I had to put it a couple of metres ahead of it because you know time and motion in lake fishing, not like on a river where they just sit in the current, wait for the food to come to them. Lake fish are nearly always moving. So when you're sight fishing on a lake, you're, you're trying to always put the fly where the fish is going to be, not where it is. Because where it is, by the time your fly gets there, is where it was. So that's, you know, that's such a skill. And it's often to do with speed. And when I guide uh, at Millbrook um, dedicated stream fishes, it's probably the single biggest thing I notice is they can't get the fly there quickly enough because they don't have to. On a river, you don't have to get the fly there quickly. Unless you spook a fish, if you see a fish feeding up behind that willow or in front of that rock, it's probably going to be there until the food runs out or something scares it. You know, you sit down and have a cup of tea and come back and it'll still be, still be there. But on the lake, it's small windows of opportunity open. One, two, three, close. Don't know where the fish is anymore. And that might come along once an hour, might come along once a day. But they're your opportunities and you've got to get your fly to the fish quickly. During the uh, lockdown for us, when we couldn't go fishing, um, I had my boys out in the paddock throwing soccer cones. Um, one would throw the cone and the other one would cast to it. So they were practicing that really quick. There it is, get the fly there. There it is, get the fly there. Mark Youngman would know that from uh, Tasmanian Western Lakes fishing, as would many others of you, but uh, multiply the urgency by a factor of 10 for Victorian lakes because those opportunities are comparatively rare. So when they come along, you gotta be ready. So this is the single hardest part and I've been sort of thinking how can I get this across in a legitimate way without sounding like a wanker, not to put too fine a point on it? Because what I'm asking you to do, if you are, if you are an angler who doesn't have a lot of confidence in Western Victorian lakes, I'm asking you to be confident when you don't have any reason to be other than listening to me and reading my book. And that's a big ask. It's a really big ask. And I get it. You know, I really get it. But I've just got to tell you that 
the only way you're going to consistently have success on these lakes is to keep believing that it's going to work and keep trying. And there's a few reasons for that. And one is that it's, you're just not going to get that positive reinforcement you get on a stream. You know, 99 times out of 100, you are not going to get out of the car at Lake Vines and there's going to be a fish rising every 10 metres. That happens on the Ovens River. It doesn't happen on Lake Pines. It might happen once literally in a blue moon during a termite fall or a huge dunhatch. But mostly you're not going to get that, oh, there's a fish, there's another fish, which keeps you going. So you've got to just go back to that planning we talked about and you're saying to yourself, well, I know Lake Pines has had really good stocking. I know the water conditions have been perfect. The, the, the trout in Lake Pines is not going to have to worry about dying of bad water. It's only going to have to. It's only going to die in a pelican or a cormoran or an angler. Um, so, you know, you know when you go to Lake Pines that there's a good head of fish, even if you can't always see them. You can go back through those stocking records, those water level records, and you'll see all is well. The fish are there, and you've got to believe that. If you don't believe it then you don't try. And if you don't try, go back to the car and drive up to the Stevenson and get back into the stream fishing because you're just not gonna fluke a fish on these lakes. You're just not gonna be able to aimlessly walk around wondering what time lunch is and whether you've got time to get to a stream before dark. You're not gonna catch fish like that. You've got to apply yourself. You've got to try. And one of the things you've got to do, I reckon, and this is my lake sense thing that I go on about, is you've got to be, you've got to be looking. You've got to be looking and listening and, you know, being the real predator, being the real hunter, as if your life depended upon it. Just a casual sweep of the water, you know, chatting away to your mate. You ain't gonna see them. You're not gonna notice a lot of these fish, you know, you're only going to notice the really obvious ones and they're just a fraction. So you've got to, uh, you've got to apply yourself and then you've got to be ready in a moment to get your cast there to make the most of the opportunity. So I'm going to tell you about this afternoon. Um, so this morning I had to finish a couple of magazine articles. At lunchtime, my brother Mark said, let's, uh, I'm just proving to you that I'm not entirely a man of leisure. At lunchtime, my brother Mark said, we've got a few clients coming to Millbrook next week. Let's go and see if there are any duns about. So we went and uh, checked out one of the lakes. There were a few duns. And then I said to Mark, I gotta go. I wanna, just because I got this talk tonight, I wanna just see if I can give, give everybody a little bit of a, an update. I've been to a few lakes in the last couple of weeks, but I haven't been to Newland. So I said, I'm going to check out Newland because it's an important lake. And I also thought, you know, I reckon things are going to be pretty good at Newland. So I looked at the water storage information. Look, I already, I already knew that Newland hasn't been critically low for years. So over summer survival won't have been an issue. I like the fact that the graph told me it had been full for a few weeks because the last time I was there, it wasn't full and it was looking pretty dirty. Um, but a few weeks on, it's been stable for a while. That's often an indicator of, of clear water, full and overflowing um, without any little spikes that suggest that it's over full, which would mean flooding water flowing in. So, you know, if I had never been in Newland before in my life, I would have been able to look at that graph and get some idea about that water history. We looked earlier, as it turns out, at Newland stocking history, knew that's pretty good too. Looked at the weather, moderately strong west southwesterly. There's a whole shore on the far side of the dam wall at Newland that, that suits that wind. And it's a good shore. Most shores of, of Newland are good. There's one or two I don't like, but that one, that one I certainly do. Um, intermittent cloud, not freezing cold, cold but not ridiculous, not like it's going to be later in the week. Thought there might be a few bugs about, <laughs> might be a bit of activity. So I thought it's, a, it's going to be a good call. So I got there and that's what it looked like. And, you know, it looked great to be honest, really looked good. Uh, when I had to leave at about uh, four o'clock to take my son to soccer training, 
I was really conflicted. I didn't want to leave, right? Because it really looked good. And the, the clarity was excellent, probably about five foot. So not super duper polaroiding clear, but great for having confidence that the fish will find your fly. Mind you, I think we're often, we often underestimate just how far away a trout can find it in dirty water, but nevertheless, it's good confidence and water that looks reasonably clear. It had risen right back up into the grass, but it was stable. So everything was sort of settled. Um, the wind was as I expected off that Western shore. So there was lots of calmish water for a fair way out. So I knew that if a fish moved, I'd have a fair chance of, of, of seeing it. And then first half kilometer I walked, didn't see a thing. A couple of little dimples from stockies perhaps, but nothing else. But you know, I didn't think, oh God, I wish I wasn't here. I thought, no worries, half a kilometre is nothing. Let's just keep looking, everything looks right, this is gonna work. Um, I got to a gap in the willows and out of the corner of my right eye, I saw a distinct swirl, not straight ahead, out of, in my peripheral vision. I saw a really powerful swirl. I thought, that's no stocky, that's a good fish. So I raced along, I'd had my BMS tied on, tied on since I'd left the car. Never leave the car without a fly tied on. I don't care what it is, just tie on a fly. Of course, you don't know whether the very first bit of lake you see is going to produce a fish and that's the only chance you get, or it's going to be at the end of the day, you're going to see a fish. But if you don't have a fly tied on, you may just miss that one little window of opportunity. So make a considered decision and by all means change it if after an hour or so, something suggests it's not wasn't the right choice of fly, but you know, you can tie in a BMS or a scintilla stick caddis or a damsel fly nymph on any of these lakes, and you're gonna be in with a fighting chance, any time of year, any condition. And like I say, you can refine that fly as evidence is, is produced to the contrary, but have it on because you do not wanna be tying a fly on, stopping tying a fly on, whilst your one three second opportunity of the afternoon appears. So I had a BMS tied on, good olive BMS, green bead apparently. I can't tell you it's between green beads and red beads, but I'm told it was a green bead. Um, Smallish, probably about a size 12, but not tiny. Um, and it's been a good fly for me as have several over the last few months. So I'm confident in it, that's good. Um, and I saw that swell. And I threw the fly out, let it settle, figure eight retrieve. This is the, con you can see the conditions. You can picture me off one of these willows casting at sort of 45 degrees. Fly was, fish was only about five meters beyond the willows. Letting the fly settle on the cast. I really like that. Plop, let it settle and then start figure eighting. I reckon about half the time when I hook a fish on these lakes, it's actually eaten the fly on the drop. It's come over and heard the splash and the fly's just settling down. Probably looks like a minnow diving for the bottom. And I start figure eighting and then there's just weight there. And that's what happened this time. Not on the first cast, but on the second cast. So the area where the fish had, fish had moved. And um, voila, I had a nice little two pound Eulen Brown. Now that was good in itself. That was great. Fought hard, jumped around, beautiful fish. Look at the tail, you know. We rubbish our stocked fish, but really, um, most of the time you get a brown out of most of these lakes and, and a rainbow for that matter. By the time they're that big, they might as well be wild. And I'll talk a bit about that later. Um, so I, I had my Newland Brownie with the BMS in his jaw. And I talk in the book about the fact that, you know, that one moment changes everything because trout are rarely individualists. So having caught that one, I then thought, I bet you there's other fish doing the same thing. Perhaps they're coming in and out of the willows. Maybe they're getting something just beyond the willows. But, you know, that fish came from a, from a particular kind of water and I had hundreds of metres of it ahead of me. So I thought, I'm going to search that water whilst I look and listen. Now, I'm not going to gild the lily. I didn't see any more fish. But after about 100 metres, another one grabbed my fly and I got that one too. And that one was uh, a little bit bigger than the one in the picture. So, you know, four o'clock, 
I had to pull up stumps and walk back to the car and I'd, in two hours I'd caught two fish I'd be happy to catch in Penstock Lagoon or Little Pine. Um, and I won't lie, it's not always that easy. Sometimes the fish are bigger, sometimes they're smaller. But, you know, I think that's a pretty honest September day on a, on a Western Victorian lake, if there is such a thing. Um, and well worthwhile. And superficially, you know, there wasn't a great deal that I based that on. Now, <clears throat> people listening to this who fish competition style and their approach is different to mine. And that's absolutely fine. You know, I'm not, I'm not disputing the value of, you know, two or three flies on long leaders repetitively stripped. You know, that's often how someone like Tom Jarman fishes and he does really, really well nothing wrong with that tactic it's just that's not how i fish i do this lake sense thing where i'm searching and looking you know and i'm trying to get a big one too i'm not interested in trying to catch a stocky i'm trying to get a decent fish um so i'm really covering the water but i'm looking and listening my, my eyes and ears almost hurt by the time i walk off the lake at the end of the day i've been trying so hard um, and hours just evaporate, not because I'm bored, but because I've just, I don't know where the time goes because I'm so focused. I'm, so, I'm trying so hard and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So, you know, keep going along the willows and bang, hook another one. Um, so, you know, that's the mindset I'm after. And I understand completely that you probably some of you are sitting there with your arms folded saying hey it's all very well for you to say but i've been up to the lakes 10 times and never seen a fish so what are you on about and it's a fair it's a fair question but all i can say is do your homework they're there don't rely too heavily on facebook i mean by all means use the good sites use reliable friends if you think they're going to help point in the right direction, but just don't Google Newland Reservoir and expect to experience what I've just shown you there, right? Because it doesn't work like that. Remember, most people who don't catch anything want to complain, those that do want to keep it to themselves, and then there's the frighteningly large chunk who just makes shit up, right? And what can we do to what can we do about it? We can't do anything because we just don't know. We don't know who they are, right? We don't know. Joe Blow says, Oh, I caught five, ten pounders at Newland yesterday. We don't know. We, we highly suspect it's not true, but we don't know him. We don't know his credentials. Don't even know if he's real. You know? So I prefer to use the information if I can that I know is beyond fault, such as BFA stocking figures water condition figures and um, water supply, uh, wa weather condition forecasts. You know, that's hard, that's cold hard information. And uh, you can begin to manufacture your own fishing report and anticipation based on that sort of stuff. Um, so, a bit of editorialising now. Um, I, you've caught your, your, your Newland or your Hepburn or your Wendaree or your Mirabal or Fines trout. And as far as the regulations are concerned, you're allowed to take it. There is a 45 centimetre limit at Hepburn, which is great, and a three fish limit. Um, but I really hate hearing these lakes described as put and take fisheries. You know, Tukey Trout Farm and Buxton Trout Farm, they're put and take fisheries. These are put and grow fisheries. Um, you know, once the stocked fish have been at large for a few months, they're effectively wild fish, you know? Sure, it takes them a little while to get used to it, and a few of them die in the process, probably more than a few. But once they've been in there for a while, I mean, look at that mirable fish, that is, that is world class. That wouldn't be out of place. I mean, if you're in Tasmania, you'd, no offence, Mark Youngman, but you would see, you'd be lucky to see one of those every decade, wouldn't you? You know, 
That's an eight pound silver slab. Perfect tail, perfect fins. Now, there's quite a few of those fish out there, but there would be more of them if we didn't constantly hear these lakes referred to as put and take. So you're not obliged to take your fish but just because it's somehow inferior by virtue of having been stocked once upon a time. So that fish in the photo is still swimming around in Mirable, unless someone's caught it since and kept it. Um, and, you know, I hope it will be for a couple more years yet. Um, you know, don't underestimate the growth potential of these fish if they're let go. And the rainbows, we know they persist for three, four or five years if they're allowed to. You know, the rumour that rainbows die within a year or so of being released is brought about by the fact that most of them are caught within a year or so of being released. They're four times more easy, easy to catch than brown trout on average. So, yeah, they die all right, but they die in white buckets. They don't die of sort of some sort of natural ticking time bomb inside them. So, you know, the rainbows, if they're allowed to keep going, will. They'll keep going, not for as long as the browns, but, you know, three, four, five years. We've got the science proves it. So, yeah, that's my final sort of plea to you, I suppose, is, you know, by all means, keep a fish if you want to keep a fish, but just please fish these lakes, all of them, as put and grow fisheries, not put and take. I hate that term, put and take. You know, as if fisheries put them in, we take them out. Bad, bad attitude. By all means, keep, keep one or two. You can keep however many you like within the regulations, of course. This is just my opinion, but. If we can, if we can treat these waters as put and grow, I reckon we're doing all of us a favour. So, um, thanks for listening. And any questions? Delighted to take them. Yeah, can you unmute everyone, Steve? Yeah. Hello. Um, yeah. Can I just ask that, that um, people just put their topic of their um, question into the into the chat, um, and then we can go through one at a time so everyone doesn't talk over each other. This is the part of Zoom meeting that I find the most challenging is managing questions. So bear with me. I'll do my I'll do my best. I may as well close this too, I think. Uh, oh. Stop share. Oh, Mr. Flynn. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've been watching. <laughs> there you go. I just, well, I got the story straight. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice twelve pounder there, Dan. Thank you. Eleven point five. Eleven point five. Great. Okay, Dushan. Dushan's got a question. Yeah, I'm just wondering um, the colours for the simpler caddis. You mentioned it before, but I know I'm just wondering what the preferences in colours you actually would prefer because I, I do have a. Yeah, good, good question. I don't, I don't think you need to get too hung up on the precise colour. I would like a sort of light olive green as one and a dark, almost sort of black. I think on the packet it's called dark orange. But to me, it looks almost black. I think they're the two colours. Um, matching, matching the sort of dying weed on the one hand and matching this vibrant living weed on the other. And, uh, and then the head um, of it, I think, basically that sort of uh, yellow chenille, but have a couple with orange too. Like the orange head sometimes seems to be a bit of a party trick. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah, good question. Yeah. All right, thanks for that. Uh, next question is Ray. Oh, yes, good. Thank you. Would you like me to speak? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. Yeah, to getting on to the catch and, uh, catch and release thing, put and take, catch and release. Is there any feeling around Victoria that one day in some of our waters, we might have a, a, a catch and release only rule? 
yeah. there is um, amongst a group like this, but um, in the wider fishing community, it's no. it's pretty challenging. Um, Christopher would know that from his time at Birdfish and since. Um, so I think it's probably a bridge too far, but you know, for the first time in my lifetime at Hepburn Lagoon and Tolondo, we do have something along the lines of put and grow regulations with the 45 centimetre limit at Hepburn. You can't keep a fish under 45 centimetres and you can only keep three. At Tolondo, it's a similar reg, but rainbows are sort of excluded from it. It's for brown trout. Again, that, that old myth that the rainbows are going to die anyway seems to have persisted despite the fact that the science shows otherwise. So I think um, with fisheries management, I, I always try to be a bit of a realist. You know, what's really what's realistically achievable versus what I'd like if I were God. And I've learned over the over the decades that uh, what I'd like if I were God is usually not want what the majority would like. So you go for something less ambitious and look, hey, you know, you take your wins when you can get them, such as what we've got with the regs on the Rubicon, such as what we've got with the regs on Hepburn Lagoon. And I think, you know, small steps, hopefully a few people will realise that, hey, maybe being able to keep three fish over 45 centimetres is actually quite a good bag. Um, and it, 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 it's, it's quite nice to be able to fish a lake where, you, where at least in theory the sort of stockies aren't being ripped out to someone's bucket, um, sort of straight out of the truck into a bucket, which is the case on many of our other lakes still, disappointingly. You know, that's the thing, the growth potential of these lakes is so great. If it was Pretty Valley Reservoir or Rocky Valley Dam, I wouldn't be so cut up about it. But when you look at that beautiful fish from Mirable, or the one on the end of my line at Hepburn, or even that, those browns I caught today at, at, at Newland, you know, that's what, that's what these lakes should be about, fish of that quality. And they can be, and the biggest limitation assuming good water good water security and quality is is tape is angler tape so it's it's um it's 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 difficult um but somewhere in between is i think the guy i think catch and release is a, is a dream to be perfectly honest uh, very good thank you uh so the next one is kieran how are you going uh, i'm just wondering in regards um fly line whether you use floating or sinking or intermediate, does it really matter? Because trout in the lakes are always moving, so they're searching for food. But the water column really does it come into it? Here, and it's an excellent question, and I must admit, I do feel guilty from time to time that I don't use more non-floating lines. Um, so I mostly use a floating line, in other words. Um, the, the legitimate reasons that I use floating lines are because of my lake sense approach, where I'm constantly on the lookout for a target to get a fly to quickly. That's most easily achieved with a floating line. Um, the second legit, legitimate reason for me using a floating line is that with sinking lines, of course, if you're fishing from the shore, there are all sorts of logistical problems. With uh, sink tips get away, away from it to some extent, but having the line sink at your feet, yes, you can use a stripping basket, but then you're not very mobile. All those, all those sorts of things come into it. So um, I think they're the legitimate reasons, but, but to be fair, I think there are times when I really should be using sinking lines more than I do from the shore. And I don't because, you know what, I probably can't be bothered changing, which, is, uh, which sounds a bit pathetic coming from someone who's supposed to be trying very hard. But there you go. That's just being honest. Um, from a boat, different story. Very happy to use uh, sinking lines from a boat. But again, probably not a full sinking line very often unless I'm sort of left with no choice because I, my, my personal approach, and that's all I can talk about is my personal approach. I can't give you advice on you know, competition techniques. You'd be far better off speaking to the likes of you know, Steve Barger or Tom Jarman about those sort of, you know, those really dedicated searching techniques, which by the way, I greatly admire and do not consider to be blind flogging. But it's just not how I generally fish. I generally fish, I invest enormously in trying to find a fish to cast to. So that is more easily achieved with a floating line. 
Cool. Um, Mike Edwards has got a similar question about um, fly lines. Mike, right. do you want to elaborate? Press the space bar if you want to talk. Oh, rightio. Uh, can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Okay. Mike. So my question, Phil, really, it's probably been answered about the type of line, but really different weights to use for different conditions? Oh, no, weights is, weights is a really good question. That's a great question. And we haven't really addressed that with the gear. Um, so I guess my stock standard Western Victorian lake fishing outfit is a nine and a half foot rod. Um, the extra six inches gives me a lot. I'd go for 10 if I was in a boat all the time, but I really like to fish the hang at the end. And I find that it, from, from the shore and I find a nine and a half foot rod gives me advantages there. And six weight is a pretty good, um, you know, I can punch out a heavy fly in a strong wind if I have to, but it's not overkill for presenting that sort of scintilla stick caddis to a side of brown trout on a bright day. Okay. So it's, it, 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 it's, it's, in it's, in, it's in between. I know these days a six weight is considered to be a heavy, but for me, a seven weight would be heavy, five weight would be light, and uh, six is about right. But if you're using a five or a seven, I'm not going to think, geez, you're not going to catch any fish. That's for damn sure. Okay. Thank you. No worries. Uh, Mark Youngman. Hi. <coughs> Mark, hello. Oh, hi. How are you going, Phil? Good, all right. Oh, yeah. I think that question's been answered. Um, so, we had Staggy, I didn't hear the talk the other day, uh, giving a talk about how he um, casts, and I know you use mainly floating lines and a lot yep. of sight fishing. Um, yep. I, knew, I was interested in looking at Newell on there. Just, so I have fished it for ages, and it just looks like yesterday. Um, yes, it doesn't change much. It's quite weird, isn't it? Yeah, no, it looks good. And yep. Newell's a good lake too. Um, so... Staggy was talking about, uh, according to Steve, um, about when he casts out out of a boat, uh, mainly just doing a couple of little strips to start with, just to get the line tight. Yep. Um, and I presume mainly you fish with one fly off the shore, do you? Mostly, Mark, yes. Not yeah. always, but yeah. probably yeah. more often than not, yes, because they're more efficient to cast quickly. Yeah. So I yeah. um, just want to talk about... Um, that when your fly hits the water and just um, how you sort of deal with that. Yep. Perhaps yep. based on a few different styles of fishing and yeah. just um, have the retrieve is that, and yeah. the sink. Yeah. It's, a, yeah. it's a really good question. I, t I tried to touch on it, but it's worth reiterating. So, you know, I'm conscious of not, you know, of giving you a straight answer rather than saying, you know, there's 10 different approaches. So let's go for the most common. And one that I've caught all my, a lot of my very best fish doing is I cast out uh, with my floating line, with my, probably should have added this, probably about a 12, 13 foot leader. Got probably three foot of tippet on at least on a nine foot leader. Um, heavy tippet, as you know. Um, I'm letting the fly land and I'm letting it settle. And you know what? I haven't really thought about this, but I think I probably try to have a reasonably good connection between me and the, the settling fly um, for exactly the reasons you described. Um, I don't want to go really tight because I want the fly to settle, bearing in mind that I'm not using a sinking line as Staggy would. So I can understand how he would be, be keen to get that little bit of slack out of the line straight away because I do think there's no doubt the fish respond to the plot a lot. and so. Often, as I said earlier, by the time I start my retrieve, I reckon the fish is probably eating the fly or is looking at it hard and eats it almost straight away. Not always by any means, but it happens a lot, including today with both fish at Newland. Um, my favorite retrieve by far is a steady figure eight gathering retrieve, I suppose you'd call it. Um, by far my favorite retrieve. And funnily enough, I use that with just about every fly, even minnow flies. Um, two reasons for that. Um, one, a, a, an angler told me once years ago, and it just stuck in my mind that trout aren't in this for the sport. So they want the easy meal. You know, success as a trout 
is a calorie profit. Um, so the more energy you expend trying to catch something, the more energy it has to give you. So something that's easy to catch is enormously appealing. Um, Gary LaFontaine wrote that in, when it comes to what we would call smelters, his observations suggested, and I tend to agree, that a significant chunk of the trout population never learn how to do it. Like the killer whales in Patagonia feeding on the seal pups, a whole swag of them never learn how to do it and just give up and go and eat snails or something, right? So it's hard, it's hard to catch minnows. So I think let's make it easy for a smelter. So rather than sort of roly polying, because you see it smelter crash and splash and carry on and you think, gosh, let's rip that fly back fast and make it exciting. Trout's not looking for excitement, the trout's looking for an easy meal. So I reckon even for a fish smelting, figure eight. Now, do I strip? Yes, sometimes I do, but my default is cast out, let fly sink, whether that's a woolly bugger or a stick caddis or a, you know, Tom Jones and figure eight it, you know, give them the easy, easy meal. And the funny thing is sometimes, not always, sometimes when I hook, hook fish under those circumstances, you can just see the fish has obviously not tried to, um, you know, it's not trying to kill the fly, it's just inhaling it, you know? It's just, like I say, you just feel weight come up. You know, the eight pounder at Mirable the other week, um, the, the fish that I caught today, and a couple that I've caught have been recently, admittedly a couple of them have tried to pull right out of my hand, but it's just been, oh, is that weed? Oh no, it's a fish, you know, and there's weight there. So I think that's a response to an easy meal from the fish, which I think is a good thing, you know? That's what, that's how you if, you, if you, if you could control it, that's how you'd like your fish to hit. Of course, the power like that, it's very exciting, but it often goes wrong, you know? They often miss, I had, I had, had one fish nearly pull the rod out of my hand at Hepburn a couple of weeks ago and um, I got my beaded fly back and the bead had been knocked off. Um, happened to me at um, Fines last year and the hook snapped, you know, all that sort of stuff. So I think if we could control it, and of course we can't, that nice steady, yep, I'm eating that, is a good, is a good kind of take. I reckon competition fishermen would like that sort of take because they would lose very few fish with it. <laughs> um, Bill, with those um, smelters and that, I've, I'm sure you have too. I've actually um, watched um, from above in the Tamer River and you see the trout just going around really slowly. Mm -hmm. And then they sort of like dart in a thousand miles an hour yep. at the bait. And you yep. see the bait showering. Yep. And then they just cut, cruise back in slowly and just pick up the stunned ones as they're sinking. 100%. So I don't know 100%. whether they, that's sort of like what they do in the lakes there, but... Um, it's exactly what they do in the lakes, Mark. With one, there's, there's exceptions to everything. So they can feed on gudgeon and big galaxids differently, but that's exactly what they do. <coughs> and the sick and the injured. Um, so so that with, you'll, you'll see schools of minnows swimming along. We shouldn't spend too long on this, but you'll see schools of minnows swimming along where one stands out and it'll mostly be because it's got, a, it's got a disease. And one of the first things that happens to a diseased minnow is its chromatophores, the things in its skin that enable it to change color have stopped working. So rather than being that shimmery, silvery, invisible color that they want to be, you'll see one swimming along that's dark. Now, when that school gets busted up, have a guess which one's going to get eaten first. Mm -hmm. And so as well as the stunned ones, they'll prey on the sick and injured. Greg French once told me that when him and Rob Sloan were um, doing the survey of the Western Lakes many years ago to see which lakes had trout and which ones didn't, they always could tell when a, when a lake had healthy trout without even making a cast by the health of the Galaxia schools. If the Galaxia schools didn't have any injured or sick members, <laughs> you could tell that it was a pretty healthy head of uh, fish in the lake. But if there were <laughs> some with fungus and Taddy fins and you know the various different ailments that minnows have. It was a pretty good show that they weren't being cropped much. So either it was a trophy lake or there weren't any trout in it at all. Do you use weight fill at all in your flies? Enough to make them sink, Mark, and that's about it. Just so, just a few On a bright on a bright day at somewhere like Tullarup or. Um, 
buy-ins where I do want the fly to get down, yes, I will have will have some weight in the fly, and I'll yeah. I'll count it down on a long leader. Just just a bit of lead or something usually. Yeah, lead. Usually it's a bead. Usually I'll go a bead. Yeah. I probably I've got some woolly buggers with tungsten beads. You can bean that sort of thing. We're not talking about there though. It should stick with Western Victorian lakes. Mm. I hope you weren't brought in here under false pretenses when you saw Western lakes. <laughs> I reckon those lakes you've got. Um, there, Phil Bushel. Fantastic lakes. Sorry. I really think those yeah, they are. fishing in those yeah. lakes. I really do. And they're pretty lucky if you can get out and get into them when they're at the right levels and everything like this time yeah. of year. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very true. Thanks, Mark. Uh, yeah, g'day, Phil. Uh, so, next question we've got Phil Bushel. Yeah, g'day, g'day Phil. Um, oh, I've noticed, I've noticed, say again. That's a lovely fish. Yeah, that's an Ariti Brown, an eight pounder. Beautiful. <laughs> um, I've noticed a few big carcasses on the uh, on the western shore at Hepburn. Is there a bit of a few eagles that um, take advantage of some of the fish in the shallow water there? I don't know. I've never seen. I haven't seen a carcass myself, um, so I, I don't know, mate. What what the story is there? That's uh, yeah, I haven't seen it. Is, is this recently? Uh, it was probably um, 12 months ago. Yeah. Um, no, I haven't. I know, I know that Hepburn probably over sort of summer, early autumn, I think that main basin can get a bit, a bit shallow and um, perhaps get a, a few stressed fish. But, yeah, I look, I don't know whether that's careless release and the water rats have found them, whether, the, the, as you say, sea eagles or ospreys have got them. Whether they've died of something else, um, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm pleased to say I've not seen that myself, but no doubt it happens. Yeah, yeah too big for shags. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, I don't know, Bill. Sorry, I don't. I don't have a maybe they were possible explanations. Careless, careless release, um, uh, predation from ospreys or sea eagles, um, or they've just, you know found themselves in the wrong part of the lake on a hot night and well, probably most of the time I've been there it's the six foot surf yeah right <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah look when I talk about put and grow I'm not saying that trout never die of course obviously they do eventually natural causes but you know the fact that they're big fish is somewhat encouraging because it shows they at least got that far before they washed up yeah thanks uh, next question Andrew yeah, so just wondering if you've been to Tolondo recently. I saw a post from a, um, a well, recently well-known fly fisherman saying he'd been there recently and the water conditions have pretty much deteriorated to terrible, um, attributed to, uh, to carp population. He mentioned that uh, there was no sight of um, any trout for the whole of the weekend he was there. Just wondering if you've been there recently and whether Tolondo, if you know about it, and whether it still rates amongst um, the other uh, Western lakes worth fishing and what you might think the prognosis is for the future. Yep, very, very good question. So I, um, I, I included Tolondo in my book um, and I did, I, I gave it a reliability rating of fair um and look i won't read read out but you'll you'll see from the book what my my take is um tolondo is probably in if we look at it in historic terms since the agreement was reached to put water back into it after it basically dried up in the noughties drought i would say it averages one good year in two um and i think the primary um feature of the good fishing is water. So there's a comp there are complex agreements in place to allow water to be transferred from Rocklands into Tolondo. Um, it's not so simple as some people believe as Rocklands having a trigger level. Um, there's all, com all sorts of competing interests. Um, I think there's sometimes political motivations or not for transferring the water. The bottom line is Tolondo can't manage on its own. It doesn't have enough catchment, even in the best of times, to be able to be self-generating. 
it, 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 it survives solely on whatever water is transferred out of, Lake, of Rocklands Reservoir into it. These days, at best, that is half full. That's as much as they'll, they'll let go in, no matter how much water's available. To date, it's got about a quarter of its old capacity. Um, and when it's good, it's really good. So it makes it into the book and it's good. It's been over the last decade, it's been good enough, often enough to justify its inclusion in the book. But even so, I reckon, as I say, that's about 50-50. So about um, one year, one season, however you want to divide it up. Of course, not quite that, that neat in two. There's probably been five years worth of good fishing on that lake in the last 10. There we are. That's how I put it. Now, I can't read the future. Um, I hope we'll get some, you know, good inflows into Rocklands and more water will be transferred. To what extent are carp the problem? I would think maybe they're a problem, but they may, they may I mean, I, I, I don't like carp and I'd be happy with them if they all went buggered off and died. But um, being a bit more um, calculating about it, I'd say in the case of Tolondo, it's probably they're a symptom of the condition of the water rather than the cause of the condition of the water. Now, I can't prove that, but I think if Tolondo went back to 25, 30,000 megalitres, I think presently it's about seven, um, which is just really not enough. Um, I think the trout fishery would rapidly improve. And that's one thing about a lot of these Western Victorian lakes too, you know, the recovery times just beg a belief. Um, you know, it's like the old sea monkeys in the comic books, just to add water and poof, you know, suddenly there are two or three pound trout swimming around. So um, the optimist in me hopes that with an El Nino negative IOD coming up, there's going to be enough to go into that lake to turn the water quality issues around and the fish will follow. But I can't honestly predict that. And the lake is in the book expressively rated only fair for reliability, which is the lowest rating I'll give a lake. If it's poor, it doesn't make it in the first place, reliability wise that is. So I think that's, that's the bottom line for Tolondo is water. And at the moment there's not enough. And there hasn't been for 12 months, at least. Thanks. Uh, next, we have uh, P Meter. Yeah, hi, Phil. Hi. Uh, firstly, great presentation. Thank you very much for tonight. For the Melbournians, especially myself, it's been uh, a great distraction from the lockdown. Um, right. <laughs> I just wanted to be a bit more, I wanted to, uh, if you could elaborate a bit more on actually sight casting um, when walking on shore and looking for a fish. Um, you're spot on, it's very different to a stream or a river and lake fishing when you're actually looking for a sign um, or a fish. But when it has been quiet and you do see that swirl um, and you lose the fish or the fish isn't actually feeding, it's just that one swirl. Um, do you have any tips in regards to where you would actually cast your, um, your stick caddis or your fly? It's an excellent question. Um, in the absence of anything else, and hopefully by the time you've made the cast, something else has happened or not. You know what? I'd aim for the centre of the rings. Now, I know that's contradicting a little bit about what I said about the direction the fish is moving in. But in the absence of any really good clues, you know, if the fish feed, if you see it actually happen. So this afternoon, I didn't see it happen in the sense I wasn't staring. I saw the disturbance without the corner of my eye. By the time I looked, clearly it was a trout. But... Um, I wasn't able to see the physical fish. So I didn't see its back or its tail or its dorsal fin cut through the water. So I didn't get a clue of speed and direction from that, which you sometimes can, obviously. And that's probably the most obvious um, example. Um, the other thing is the shape of the rise, the teardrop. So you would expect to sort of cast ahead of the, ahead of the, the, uh, the opposite way to the, the teardrop. The, the, other, the other thing that is great if they're feeding on any of the surface, this is great for say midge feeders or mayfly feeders or beetle feeders, uh, doesn't work very well for things like smelters, is that they will basically 
um, feed into the wind. All other things being equal, no other clues, cast up wind of where you see that move, that movement. Um, if you have the luxury of knowing whether they're rainbows or browns, browns are much more slow and deliberate. Rainbows are really quick. It's really hard, actually. Rainbows are really hard to get flies in front of because they're so quick. Um, the other thing with smelters, though, and this is a really, you know, dare I say it, a, a great tip. Um, you know, they tend to return to the scene, scene of the crime. So a really good strategy for erratic smelters that just explode in a bay and then you don't see them for half an hour, just bloody keep covering that spot. I can't tell you how many times they've come back because often the smells are where they are for a reason. There's a bit of structure. Maybe you can see it, maybe you can't, and they're hanging around it. And the fish like Mark's Tamar River minnows from the bridge, you know, they'll come, they'll, they'll const come back and, and, and charge the school again and again. You know, they'll, they'll do these um, repeat sorties. And I catch a lot of smelters that way. I repetitively, slowly, patiently covering the zone, if you like, of where that initial smash happened. And sometimes it's, you know, seven, eight, nine casts in, which is a lot of time, uh, when suddenly there he is. You know, sometimes it's one or two casts, but often it's a lot. Um, so in the absence of other clues with smelters, I'd be really happy to say to you, just keep putting your fly back into the general area until you get a better offer. So there's a few site fishing ideas for you. None of them perfect, but hopefully, you know, collectively helpful. Cheers. Makes sense. And I Does think we've got one last question. Sorry. It definitely helps it. I mean, there's no, um, I mean, there's no definite answer if you don't know where the fish really, when it's in your peripherals, it is gonna go when it's just the odd swirl. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you do, I, I have second guessed myself, do I, you know, without any evidence um, of yeah. knowing what direction it is, do I go to the left, do I go to the right, do I go straight in the between? And that's, you know, when it is those tough days and you do have that one chance, that's where you second guess yourself and go, I know. you know, make the right decision. Yeah, well, keeping in mind all those other things I've said, just go for, go, in the absence of other clues, go for the, middle of the circle, go for the bullseye and hope the fish hears a fly land. My God, it's amazing how well they hear flies land. It really is. You know, at Millbrook, I've got the luxury of being able to watch the behavior of fish in clear water quite often. And it just beggars belief how even the sound of a bloody dry fly landing, like a dun, not even a beetle or something chunky, they'll, they'll sometimes turn from two meters and come and find out what the noise was, you know? So, that's, that can give you heart, I suppose, in those situations where you, you know, get it there fast, get it there quick um, in the absence of any other clues and hope that, you know, in the time it's taking you to get your fly there, the fish is going to be able to hear or see the fly appear in the, in the picture. Anyway, it's a great question, so thanks for it. No worries, thank you. Sorry, Chris. All right, uh, next was Matthew. Matthew. Matthew there. Sorry, it's a bit hard to hear, Matthew. I can't. I'll, hear I might just read. I'll just read his question. Um, yeah, great. He just says, uh, "Why do you not fish the ten-foot rod uh, shore-based?" Oh, no good reason. Go for it if you want to. Yep. Probably. Um, there are places where it might be a little long with trees and bankside vegetation, but go for it. Use a 10 foot. I don't have a problem with that at all. There's, there's my answer. Use a, use a, oh, perhaps don't use a double handed rod because sometimes you need to do those short, precise casts. But um, yeah, I've got no problem with a 10 footer. Cool. Um, and I think lucky last question, we've got uh, Dushan. Dushan, I'm listening. Which space bar? Yeah, Dushan. <laughs> uh, he'll be off with the kids. Here you go. Okay, I'll read his question. When fishing Newlands, how often are you moving around the lake? Do you fish your favourite spots or do you keep moving until you see 
a fish. I really try not to have favourite spots. Sometimes I'm guilty of doing that. Um, and that's because I think you miss out by being too prescriptive. So I reckon, as I said, it, said in my description of today, a really big indicator for me about where, to, where I fish Newland isn't a favourite shore, but what the wind direction is. You know, the only shore that I don't fish as often as I probably ought to is the car park shore. And that's probably a bias against it for the fact that, you know, I think of it as the popular shore. But I know cold-bloodedly that if there's not anybody or very few people on that shore, the trout are just as likely to come in there anyway. So I don't have a favourite shore. I move around a lot. You know, I like to, um, you know, I, I, I try to strike a balance between spending enough time in a good looking area to know sufficient one was there with not missing out on what might be happening around the corner. So, and I reckon that, by the way, Chris, there are lots of mayfly nymphs under the rocks at Newland. I checked for you today and I did see two duns. Nowhere near enough to uh, generate a hatch, of course. But I think that's a really good example of the import. Duns are a really good example of the importance of moving around because I find it almost seems to be random on Newland and just about any other lake where the duns are going to hatch. So that's a hugely important reason not to spend too long in one spot. And the perfect recipe for Newland at done time and any other lake for that matter is for two of you to go and carry your mobile phones. Because that way, if they're rising on one side of the lake and not the other, um, and you're a good natured soul, you might let your mate know and he might be able to get there before it's all over. Uh, it is a bit of a, it is a bit of a dilemma when I, when I go there by myself, that, you know, Hepburn, Newland, Wendery, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of uh, shore and you know that there's a chance that maybe the duns are going to come up in a worthwhile fashion in maybe 10% of it. And it's not always pre predicted by wind direction or cloud cover or any of those things, you know, sometimes they just bloody well come up in one spot and not another for reasons best known to them. So that's a good reason to keep keep moving, um, but it is a balancing act between you know, uh, not just going around like a blowfly, and having a good look. Yeah, balancing the two. Thanks for that, Phil. No worries, just done. All right, guys. I don't think we've got too many questions left. Um, there is going to be. Sorry. There is going to be, yeah, can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, loud and clear. Um, um, Stephen is uh, taping the uh, presentation. Good so, so I guess um, if you feel the need, get in touch with um, with someone from the, from the Calder. Uh, otherwise, I reckon Chris or Stephen will be posting on Facebook. Um, just That's just for the... Uh, some of the people I've also had a few texts from people who can't make it. So, um, but I've got to yeah. say, though, thank you, Phil. That's that's sorry, bloody brilliant. That's, yep, that's gold. Great, that ben. It's gold, mate. Um, yep, thank you, thank you. Can I just say one more thing? Um, and that is given that this is being recorded, but in all seriousness, I really, I mean, I've stressed it a couple of times, you know, this is just my approach, right? Yep, so there will be some extremely skillful and successful anglers out there who are fishing the lakes in a different way. But as I say, that's, I can only talk with any authority about how I fish. <laughs> I can't get inside their heads, which is probably a good thing. It'd be a bit creepy if I could. So, uh, you know, it's good to be able to uh, just emphasize that at the end, you know, my way obviously works up to a point, um, but, Hey, you know, if I, I'm a great believer in the fact that, you know, fly fishing is a never ending story and there, there, there'll be, I know there are some very talented anglers out there who don't fish exactly as I fish and do very well. So, you know, you have to make your own mind up there. Can't help you. Yeah, but there's some bits of gold, you know, and, and I guess um, along with a few other people, I, I do find the Western Lakes daunting. You know, yeah. and it's the only way I guess I'm going to improve is by putting the hard yards. No one's going to do that for me. 
That's right. Yep. I'm afraid you can't just Google how am I going to catch a trout at Newland today. I mean, my book, I keep coming back to it and I apologise if I'm banging on, but, you know, that's my best, best effort to give you a comprehensive starting point. But even with that, you're still going to have to do the yards. Mm. Just gives you somewhere to do the yards from where you can do it with some sort of confidence. So, um, you know, I put my best, my best effort into that book, keeping in mind what I said about my own um, approach, not being the only approach. Um, it's, uh, yeah, but then you're right, Ben. It's, it's, you've got to put in the effort, mate. It's not, it's not, you, you look, I, I, you can walk up the Ovens River at Bright with a Royal Wolf or a stimulator or an Adams on the end and just chat to your mate and just chuck it up into the run and without really applying yourself, probably after three or four hours, you're going to have caught one or two fish. That just ain't going to happen on these lakes. Mind you, I don't fish the Ovens River like I just described either, but I make the point that it's possible to catch fish on waters like that without trying. You're just not going to fluke them on these lakes. It's about application. It's a pretty nice kind of application. You know, it's not sort of agony. <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty good fun. Yeah. And it's rewarding when it goes right too. Yeah. And sorry about everybody who's locked down, you know, the bastard, what can I say? Hopefully not much longer. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Yeah. Yeah. Fishing's, really, fishing's really terrible at the moment. You're not missing anything. <laughs> Mark, uh, uh, Philip, um, thank you very much for this. Uh, one last question, if I may. Uh, yeah, sure. Obviously, you spend a good part of your time around the shores uh, searching, um, citing your opportunities. What percentage of time would you actually spend blind casting? Oh, a fair bit, but I try to do both. Um, I would say on a slow day, so when I, for whatever reason, am seeing fewer fish, I would spend oh, half, half my total time with my fly in the water. So don't, don't think I'm just walking around for hour after hour without not ma making a cast. I'm fishing and I'm looking and listening. That's okay. why it, it, I, describe it, I describe it in this. Um, it's, it, I call it, it's, I call it my lake sense approach. It's this sort of, it's this weird combination between sight fishing and searching. You know, it's, it, it, it's a form of searching for, for, for people with poor, poor attention spans who haven't got the patience to, you know, do nothing but search. Mm -hmm. And I, and, and I've, kept, I've said it before and I'll say it again, I admire and think that I've got mates who are extremely good at just searching. I've got a mate I fish with in the, up in New South Wales and he is the world's best. I won't call him a flogger because he ain't a flogger. He is just very good at concentrating very hard on searching and doesn't really look for fish. And he laughs at me because we'll be on the boat together and I'll see a fish rise and I'm strip, 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 you know, try to get the fire there. And he's just, he, yeah, you do that. I'll just keep, you know, fishing my DI5 back at, you know, three or four metres of water. Yeah, you you go and chase you go and chase the red herrings and I'll and I'll work away. And he 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 at least holds his own with me. Unless there's a few fish really moving and then I maybe have an edge. But you know, I, I, I think I think good good searching is an absolute skill. The sort of thing that Jonathan Stagg would do or Steve Varga would do or Tom Jarman would do or Christopher Bassano would do, you know, when they're trying to win a competition. That's that's remarkable to me. You know, that's, 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 that's every bit as skillful, if not more skillful than what I'm trying to describe. So, yeah, it's uh, about when I'm doing it, I mix it. I do both. I never stop looking hard for fish. Never stop. Five hours I haven't seen a fish, I'm still looking hard for a fish. Because for me, they're the game changer. You know, that's the thing that turns my day around is when I see a fish. A fish can turn my day around and often does. Okay, so you so you're close to the water as opposed to being maybe picking an elevated point and walking along looking for for an opportunity. Sometimes I do both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it pays to be up high. Sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. 
Now, I, I hate float tubes who put that question up, but don't 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 uh, don't be offended by that. I, I find that they're kind of the worst of both worlds because you're so low to the water. And I had a bad experience on the Hopkins once where I was about two k's from the car and the wind got up, and I had to sort of paddle like a duck. And I I, I got back to my against this sort of thirty knot wind, and I got back to the car and I was utterly shattered. So that may be one reason why I don't like. Uh, Float tubes quite as much. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Yeah. yeah, but I'm sure there are some perfectly decent and reasonable people who use float tubes, you know, so I'm not one of them. Yeah. Might be just for cod, Phil. Pardon me? Just for cod, mate. Yeah, yeah, no, no, look, I mean, you've seen those incredible videos from that guy up in uh, New England, my God. I'd, yeah. I'd get in a float tube any day if that was if that was available. But on a lake, gee, you know, especially yeah. Western Victorian Lake, where there's every chance there's going to be wind, hard hard work. Yeah, kayak much happier. Not that I've used one, but I can see the appeal. It's the it's the getting around in a float tube that I find frustrating. It's just they're yeah. slow and cumbersome, and you've already heard me describe how I like to try and cover a fair bit of water. So I can see there are advantages to float tubes, and um, you know there'd be times when they could put you, get you fish that you wouldn't otherwise get. But something a bit more a float boat with oars, much more appealing. Kayak, much more appealing. Boat with an electric motor where you're allowed to use one, much more appealing. Those sorts of things. But don't feel too confined by being on the shore. There, are, you know, most of the time I don't feel most of the time occasionally different most of the time i don't feel like i'm missing out too much by being in waders as opposed to being in a boat um, and when we do use a boat often you know we just use it to get from one shore to the other which is re really useful on a lake like water or um so but we fish from boats when we've got them a bit but you know i often feel a bit more comfortable when i'm actually on the shore i feel like i've got a bit more control about where I'm going and connection with the fly and all the rest of it. But uh, boat fishing occasionally can be really exciting on those lakes and effective, but great for transport. If you're on one side of Lake Water and you need to get to the other, it's the only way. So, yeah. All right, Phil. Uh, Mark Thomas is. Sorry, Ben. No, you're right. You're right. Keep going. Oh, I just saw Mark Thomas's question come up about waders. Um, if I'm going for a quick casual fish, sometimes I will wear thigh boots. Um, if I'm going for a really dedicated fish, though, I will use chest waders and Gore-Tex with proper boots because you're much more foot shore and you're much less likely to end up with blisters. So thigh waders are really, thigh boots are a bit of a slack approach and I don't, really recommend them for anything other than a sort of quick pop out like I did today. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess um, I've worn those things as well and, and copped a, a heap of grass seeds in them. Yeah, you're walking through some of that high grass. Yeah, grass seeds, blisters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for your, for, there's no doubt for the welfare of your feet, it's worth the couple of extra minutes to put on a pair of decent chest waders and a, in particular a decent pair of, uh, of, of wading boots and don't wear felt on the lakes or you'll end up on your ass. <laughs> yeah, rubber sole wading boots. Felt has advantages on the streams but around the lakes, it's ice skating. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Right, um, hmm. look, I'm gonna have to call a night. Um, look, thank you, Phil, very much. There's a stack of messages down here um, thanking you. Um, I think most of us have got a fair bit out of this. We've got fly selection and um, yeah, I think the next best thing is uh, for people to have a look and, and go and grab one of your books. Great, thanks Ben. It's been a real pleasure. Love the questions. It's really good to have, have the opportunity to answer all those too. No yeah. worries. And, and well, well hosted, thank you. It's been really good. Yeah, I've got some good guys in the club. They're great. Yeah, very good. Very good. Geez, I never thought I'd buy a book from a man from a man from Mansfield. God, how bad's it getting? <laughs>